Okay, so I apologize for not apparently clicking record in lecture uh, yesterday, so I'm just going to do this from home today. Um, but it does give me a chance to put in the stuff that I realized was missing yesterday, and that specifically is the grand plots. But anyway, I did start off lecture yesterday with um, just looking back at the titration curve question that we had finished with on Tuesday. Um, and I just wanted to get into the bottom half of this list where we're getting into the second ice table. Um, and so I just added an extra slide here with just sort of a blank ice table. And what we'd be looking at here is if when we um, calculate our millimoles of H plus that would go in here, if it's greater than the 6.25 of the ethylene diamine that we started with. So say we had added seven millimoles um, to our, uh, our titration at this point. Um, and so then we would say, okay, well now the ethylene diamine is the limiting reagent. So we do minus six and a quarter here and minus six and a quarter here and plus six and a quarter here. And so we'd have zero and we'd have zero in uh, 0 0.75 and we'd have 6.25. And what we find here is we now have a mixture of the amphiprotic version of ethylene diamine and we have strong acid left, right? We still have 0.75 millimoles of strong acid left. And so this means we need to set up a second ice table because we have an amphiprotic, it can act as both an acid and a base, and we have a strong acid. So we still have a reaction that can happen. And so we would do a second ice table. And so we would have ENH plus plus H plus going to ENH2 2 plus and we would just bring down the numbers that we have from the previous ice table. So our ice table here, uh, e and H plus would be six and a quarter, and this would be 0 0.75. And now the point, the H plus is the limiting reagent. So this is minus 0.75, this is minus 0.75, and this is plus 0.75. So then we have 0 0.75 here at equilibrium, this is zero. And six and a quarter minus uh, 0.75 is five and a half. Okay. And then we could say, okay, well, now we've got um, ENH plus and ENH2, 2 plus. They're conjugates of each other, uh, both present in solution. So this is going to be a buffer. It's polyprotic. So that means I use the Henderson Hasselbalch equation. And because um, we're of th it's this particular combination of conjugates, um, that's going to be either the Ka1 or the Kb2 that we're going to use in the Henderson Hasselbalch. Um, and we just can plug in the numbers that we have here from our, uh, our ice table. So when you get to um, work your ice table, figure out what your get your millimoles, figure out what your limiting reagent is and do your C line, uh, and then get down to your equilibrium line. This is where you're gonna go back to that decision tree that we've looked at a couple of times now and say, okay, what do I have in solution? Um, do I have an acid? Do I have a base? Do I have an amphiprotic? Um, is there a further reaction that can happen? So if you still have strong left, if you have titrant left, then um, you need to look at, do I need to do a second ice table? If on the second ice table, if we had um, still had a number here under H+, plus, we would say, okay, we still have strong acid left. Is there anything for it to react with? And the answer is no, because enh 22 plus does not act as a base. It's fully protonated. It cannot accept another proton. We know that because we were told that ethylene diamine only has two KBs. So we can accept two protons. It has now accepted two protons. So if we have a number left for H+, plus, there's nothing else for it to react with. We're actually past the last equivalence point, And then we would treat it as a strong acid. So we would take the millimoles of H+, plus left over, put it over the total volume, to give us concentration and then treat it as a strong acid. Um, if we are at the an equivalence point, then we will have only one species in solution. So if we're at the second equivalence point, we would just have NH2, 2 plus, that's a weak acid. If we're at the first equivalence point, that's the end of this first reaction, we would just have ENH plus, that's an amphiprotic. So we'd use our amphiprotic equation. If we're before we've added any titrant, that's when we have just ethylene diamine, we treat that as a weak base. In between those points, we have buffers. 
and after the last equivalence point, we have strong acid um, in solution, though it is, we do have to account for the dilution. So hopefully that helps um, with doing titration curve questions. So watch out for having to do multiple um, ice tables. Anytime you've got more than one Ka or Kb, you will be looking at multiple ice tables um, and make sure you're, you're watching for any further reactions that might occur. Other than that, do your do the algebra in the ice table and then go to your decision tree and figure out which equation you're going to use to solve for um, the pH of that particular mixture. Okay, so the next thing we're going to talk about is indicators. So indicators, um, this one is thymol blue, and what they are is they are themselves weak acids and bases. Uh, it just so happens that their acid and base forms are different colors. So as we um, deprotonate thymol blue, we start out with red. Uh, we go through its first pKa, it turns to yellow. And then if we go through the second pKa, it turns to blue. Um, so the colors will change at the pKa's. Uh, so remember that below pK1, it will always be predominantly this form, and above pK1, it will be predominantly this form. And so that's where you see that color change. If you're right near the pKa, you might get a combination of red and yellow, so you might see orange. Um, similarly here, yellow and blue, you might see green for um, a pH of around 8.9. You want your indicators to change color when you are at the equivalence point of your titration and our equivalence point we always see a big jump in ph over a very small volume that's the sign of a good titration and so we need the ka for the indicator to be or the pka to be in the range of the ph of the um, equivalence point so we don't want the pka of the indicator to match the pka of our acid that we're titrating because then the indicator will change color at the half equivalence point we want it to change at the equivalence point so we need the pka of the indicator to match the ph at our equivalence point and just so everybody's clear on the difference between an equivalence point and an end point an equivalence point is when you've added enough titrant to react with all of your analyte um a and so you have added an equivalent amount of reagent um, an end point is a physical change. So a color change, um, it could be a voltage change, but it's something that you can measure. And so what we want is our end point to happen at the same point as our equivalence point. Um, and we want, when we say at the same point, we're talking always about the same volume, not about the same measurement. So not in the case of an acid-based titration, not at the same pH. Um, if we look at some titrations like strong acid, strong base, strong base titrations, we see massive pH changes of, of four, five, even six pH units at the equivalence point. And something that changes anywhere in that range for the indicator will be fine as an indicator. Um, so phenolphthalein commonly used for strong acid based titrations, its pKa is actually around eight. Um, so it tends to change at a a somewhat basic pH, but because the pH changes on those titrations are so big, um, that's still close enough on the volume scale um, to where our equivalence point is. So it's the volume scale that we're concerned about. We want our, our end point to be very, very close to our equivalence point on the volume scale. Um, we talk about phenolphthalein a fair bit because most people are familiar with it. Um, here's the structures of phenolphthalein. So we have the protonated version up here and the deprotonated down here. So remember that the protonated um, is what you will see at low pH where you have lots of H plus around. The deprotonated is what you will see at high pH. And for phenolphthalein, um, the deprotonated the, in, in base, this one's pink. All right, so this one's pink. And this one is colorless. So I always liked, oh, and that looks terrible. Um, there we go, let's fix that. Okay. I can't make it pink. All right, so we'll make it green. So this will be pink. And this will be colorless. 
That's still looking terrible. Oh, well, that looks terrible. We'll just have to live with it. Um, and so one of the things that I wanted, to, I pointed out in class was we can actually look at the structures here and figure out why one is pink and one is colorless. Color in a molecule is um, uh, one of the common ways to get color in a molecule is to have a conjugated pi system. So we need the electrons to, that are in the pi orbitals to be able to move throughout the conjugated pi system. And so when we look at the protonated version, we find we have three aromatic rings. Um, each of those is a conjugated pi system on their own. However, we do not have conjugation between the rings, and we know that a single aromatic ring is not enough to cr cause color um, because we know things like benzene and toluene are not colored. If you go down to the deprotonated version, what you find is that this middle carbon, right, so this carbon here and this carbon here, this middle carbon is now trigonal planar geometry, which means these three rings are in the same plane. This is all flat and there is a P orbital on this carbon. Um, and so now all three rings are conjugated together. And so we get a color here. The middle carbon is SP3 hybridized. Um, so there's no pi orbital in here for the electrons to move through and the three rings are isolated from each other. And so it's colorless. A huge list here of various indicators that are commonly available. Um, you have their transition pH range. So again, this you want to match up with the um, pH at which your equivalence point is at. Uh, you have your acid and base color, and then how to prepare the titrate, the indicator itself. When you're looking for an indicator for a particular titration, you need to match the pH range first, but then I would look at the color change and see if it's going to be which one's easiest to see. Um, so something to colorless, like a pink to colorless, you can see here phenolphthalene and thymolphthalene, colorless to pink, colorless to blue. Um, here nitramine is colorless to orange brown. Colorless to something is usually pretty easy to see. Um, something like uh, a yellow to orange might not be so easy to see. Um, here we have a, a purple to red. Again, that might be a little bit difficult to see. So, and it may also depend on your own particular color sensitivity. So you can pick one that maybe um, you have available to you and is going to give you a color change that's easy to see. Okay, so the next thing that we're going to look at is um, what I uh, sort of designate as complex problems. And so these are problems that fall outside of all the calculations that we've done so far, where our assumptions start to fail and we need to come up with another way um, to to uh, work the problem. So the first one we're going to, and a lot, sorry, a lot of these apply to what you're going to do in the titration curves experiment in lab. So we've got lots of spreadsheets here to look at um, and most of them you will be doing in lab. So the first one we're going to look at is a blurred endpoint. So if you follow this blue line down through the two titrate two equivalence points, so starting off A with untitrated base, our B is the middle of our first buffer region, C is our first equivalence point, D is our second buffer region, and E is our second equivalence point. If you look down through that, you can pretty easily identify that there are two equivalence points there and you could probably figure out the volume for each of them. So if we, without all the extra lines drawn in. So if you were looking just at the blue curve, you'd say, yeah, the equivalence point is somewhere around here and you can come down and say it's about 10 milliliters. If you went down to here, you can see that it's a little bit above 20 milliliters. If you look at the gray line going from F down to J, again, we see untitrated base, first buffer region, first equivalence point, second buffer region, but the second equivalence point is really difficult to see. There's very little sign of an inflection point at J. And the reason that this happens, uh, sorry, this is called a blurred endpoint where you can't see the endpoint. You can't see that point of inflection easily. Um, and the reason that it happens in this particular case is because the um, strength of the fully protonated version of this base, 
which is what we would have at the second equivalence point here, is actually similar to the strength of the titrant. So we have a fairly strong weak acid. And so we don't see a big jump in pH when we go from that weak acid being in solution to having the diluted titrant in solution, which is what we have after that second equivalence point. And so we don't see that sudden drop in pH because that weak acid has already brought the pH down. You can see to almost two. Um, and we're not seeing much more of a drop in pH when we add more acid to the solution, more strong acid. So that's one situation. You can see the same situation um, if you're tri titrating an acid with a base, and you can see if the final fully deprotonated base is similar in strength to the diluted titrant, you will see the same type of blurred endpoint um, at the end of a, a titration curve that goes up instead of down. The other reason that you might have a blurred endpoint is when you have lots of endpoints that are close together. So this is an example of that. There are, um, this is the titration of a peptide and there's like 20 or more equivalence points on here. And if you were to look at what all of them are indicated by the blue dots, and I think the only one you might be able to pick out on your own would be this one here that's fairly isolated from the other ones. Um, but to try and get all of these equivalence points uh, by eyeballing it would be very difficult. Um, so having lots of endpoints near each other in pH will also result in blurred endpoints. Now, we're always ent interested in the volume at the equivalence point. So if we have a blurred endpoint, how can we find that volume accurately when we can't eyeball it off of the curve? Um, and also these won't work well with indicators uh, because we don't have that sudden pH change at the equivalence point. So one of the ways to get around this is to go to derivative plots. So we've been talking about how an equivalence point is in fact a inflection point in our plot. And so therefore the second derivative would be zero at the inflection point. In this case, where we're titrating an acid with a base. Um, so we have an increase, uh, we have a positive slope. The first derivative is a maximum at the equivalence points, and the second derivative is a, um, it goes through zero. So to show you what this looks like on a spreadsheet, I'm going to pull up some data. I'm just going to make sure that this is sharing. Yes, it is. Okay. There we go. Okay, so this is what the data off of one of the auto titrators looks like. At the top here, what we have is all of the um, method information. So it gives you the date and time that it was run and who was running it and what they ran. And um, sometimes it'll actually calculate the equivalence volumes for you. If it doesn't, that's fine. You can figure it out off the graph. Um, but we, when we graph this, we're going to need to graph the derivatives. And so we're going to add that into our table here. So we have the volume and the pH measurements. Uh, then we have, they, they've actually calculated the first derivative, but you're going to do it manually um, so that you, you can show us you know how to do it. We've got um, time and temperature. Don't really care about those. Um, and again, some more uh, derivative plots here. Um, so we're going to actually calculate the first and second derivative of the pH um, with respect to volume. So first derivative... And for those of you who are uh, working through the Achieve homework, you will be asked to do this on at least one of the questions. Okay, so I've put in columns for my first and second derivative. Remember, first derivative is slope. So that's a delta y over delta x. So um, all functions start with an equal sign. And then I'm going to open a bracket. And my y is pH. So I'm going to subtract the one before from there and then divide by open a bracket again the difference in x which is the volume okay and this one the slope is zero at this point because uh, the ph hasn't changed so i can copy that all the way down to the bottom of this table just by um i get this black plus sign in the bottom right hand corner with my mouse and then just double click and it copies it all the way down the second derivative is the derivative of the first derivative so it's going to be delta first derivative over delta x so again start with an equal sign and an open bracket subtract the first derivative and then divide by the difference in the volume 
And again, copy that down. Okay, so now we need to do the titration um, graph. So I'm going to, I'm just going to put it in here. I'm going to insert, and I want a scatter plot. I'm going to do a scatter plot with the lines included. So there's my graph, and I'm going to select data. So for my first one, this is my titration curve. So, sorry, what did I click on? I clicked on axis. So the axis are the milliliters. And enter, and then the Ys. Okay, so the Ys are here. And enter. And then I'm going to add the first derivative. So my x's are still my volumes, but I started my first derivative down one point because I um, I need to be able to subtract the one before it. So I start my x's down one point. And then we'll do the second derivative. So my second derivative starts here. So again, I had to move down one more line because again, I need to be able to subtract on the first derivative. And y values are the second derivative. Okay, and so this is what our graph looks like. I haven't put a title on it. I haven't labeled the axes, which I know you all will do because that's what you do. I'm going to take off the grid lines because I think they're stupid. Um, they don't serve much purpose unless you're actually trying to read a number off the graph, and we're not going to actually try and read numbers off this graph. Um, I would like to add a legend. There we go. I'm just going to move it out of the way so I can make the graph a bit bigger. There we go. Now, um, some of the default settings in Excel make for some pretty stupid looking graphs. Um, so I always suggest try to make it look not stupid. So one of the things is it would be nice if it didn't look like it was drawn by crayon. Um, so I'm going to go in and format this. So I've just right, I've selected that data series and then right clicked on it to get format data series. And I'm going to look at the marker and my marker options. I do want a marker on this one, but what I would like is for it to be smaller. So I'm gonna reduce the size of it. Okay, because I don't want them overlapping each other. I'd like to be able to see the individual points. And the nice thing about that is that it allows you to see how many points there are that were recorded to make this line. Um, if there were only 10 points on this titration curve, the derivative plots would be pretty awful. Then if I look at the line, I'm just going to reduce the thickness of it a little bit so it's not quite so chunky. For the derivatives, we don't really need to see the points. Um, so I'm going to set the marker option to be none. And again, going to drop the chunkiness of the line a bit. And similarly with the first derivative, no marker. Okay, and then just drop. Okay, and then the last thing that we can do is it's kind of difficult to see the first derivative because it's actually right behind the second derivative. And um, so we can see a little bit of the first derivative here, 
Um, and you can sort of see that there is maybe some more orange in here along the way, but it's not all that easy to see. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to the first, uh, the sorry, the second derivative plot, and I'm going to plot it on the secondary axis. And so that gives me a second y-axis on the right, so that the gray line is now plotted against the secondary y-axis, and the other two are plotted against the primary y-axis, which is on the left. You can plot both derivatives on the second secondary y-axis, if that makes sense. It all depends on their relative scale. Um, so in this case, our second derivative, the scale is between negative 25 and plus 15, um, which because our titration curve, as you can see, is all between 3 and 10, that's going to really, if we plotted them on the same as the secondary derivative, our titration curve is squished in to sort of less than half of the space on the graph, uh, which is far from ideal. We want to be able to actually tell that it's a titration curve. Um, the scale for the secondary, uh, for the, sorry, the second derivative can get very large. It can get up into the hundreds and even the thousands. Um, so then you would definitely want to put it on a separate scale. But when you're looking at this, you want to be able you want to be able to tell that the titration curve actually looks like a titration curve. You want to be able to see both of the derivative plots um, cleanly and clearly. For the second derivative, it's important to be able to see where it crosses zero. Um, so actually seeing where it's a maximum, where it's a minimum is less important. And in some cases, you may find that it makes sense to to change the scale so that you're not actually showing the maximum min on the secondary, the second derivative, just because you don't need the maximum, you need where it crosses zero. And if this scale ends up being plus or minus a thousand, um, that makes it really difficult to really see um, where the zero point is. For the first derivative, it's important to see where it's at a maximum. So you want to make sure you're definitely showing where it's at a maximum or at a minimum um, if you were dealing with um, a titration of a base. Okay, so I hope that covers everything for the derivative plots. Pretty easy to do the math um, and then do the graph. Make sure, again, that you put on a title, that you label the axes. Oh, the other thing I should mention is units. Um, the titration curve does not have units for the y direction um, because pH is unitless, but both derivatives do have units. You can indicate the units on the axis, okay? So on, on the two axes for the derivative, or you could put it in the legend. All right, so the next thing I'm gonna look at is something else that you need for the lab, because uh, you do need to do derivative plots on all your experimental curves, but on one curve, we're gonna ask you to do a grand plot. So a grand plot, so let me go back to here. To make sure that that's what's being shared. Okay, I think we're good. Okay, so the sorry, I'm just checking that again. Yeah, the um. So there's, oh, sorry, grand plots. So one of the problems with using derivative plots to find an equivalence point is that the titration data itself is actually least accurate at the equivalence point because you have the least amount of buffering in the solution. Um, so you, you will see big jumps in pH and the response of the electrode can be sluggish. So you may, your pH electrode may not keep up with the changes in pH. And so you may not get the best reading from a derivative plot. Uh, a grand plot helps to get around this because it actually uses the data um, from before the equivalence point um, to then locate the equivalence point. So the derivation of the grand plot is in the textbook if you want to look it up. But basically what you're doing is you're taking the volume of the titrant. In this case, the titrant is a base. This is for malonic acid times 10 to the negative pH. And you're plotting that against the volume of the titrant. And that will give you a plot that looks like this. And you can see that it is linear and we extend the line down to where it crosses the x-axis and that gives the equivalence volume. These points here have not been included in the linear regression because they don't fit into the linear regression. Um, if you're going to titrate, 
a base, so this is for titration of an acid, the one that's on the slide. If you're going to titrate a base, um, then this becomes volume of the acid on the x-axis, and the y-axis becomes volume of acid times 10 to the positive pH. So notice the change in sign in the exponent when you're titrating a base. Um, so if you're and titrating a base, so that would mean the titrant would be acid. So you'd have VA and VA, and then 10 to the neg, 10 to the positive pH um, up here. So for creating the gram plot, you generally want to aim to use the last 10 to 20 percent of the volume before the equivalence point. Um, so what we have here, this has actually gone a little bit farther than that. It's got about the last 30 percent. And if you actually look at this, this is actually starting to curve this way a little bit so that maybe that point should actually be taken out maybe a couple of points at the top end should be taken out because we have gone a bit beyond the 30 percent so i just want to show you how you create this grand plot um, so that you can get this equivalence point where your projection crosses the x-axis okay so do 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 All right, so this was the graph we just did, and we want to do a grand plot on this first equivalence point here. So we need to pull out the data around that first equivalence point, um, and we know it's going to be around 30 milliliters. So I'm going to go scroll down my data, and I'm just going to copy and paste the data that's around the 30 millimeter point. Oh, I'm reading this backwards. Okay, so I'm going to start here at 20, and I'm going to go up past 30 milliliters, um, and I can always take points out later if I don't need them. So I'm going to go all the way up to 35. And all I'm going to do is copy and paste this somewhere else on the spreadsheet. So copy, and then, oh, actually, it's already up here. It's already been pasted up here. Um, so I won't bother to paste it. Okay. Sorry, I'd forgotten I'd already put it up here. So this is just the data from 20 to 30 milliliters copied the volume and the pH, and then I've calculated the volume times 10 to the negative pH numbers here. I don't know why those are numbers and not a formula. And I don't know why. Oh, I know why I have it twice. Okay, so it would be equal to this times 10 to raise to the power of negative of the pH it doesn't want to let me click on pH yeah okay fine I know you want another number in here but you're not gonna let me click yeah it's not happy all right I'll just drag that down there okay there we go and then I could drag that down um, all the way I know now why these are numbers I do know. You'll see why. Um, because I'm going to have to move them, and it's easier to move them if they're numbers. So if I copy this all the way down, now these are all formulas. If I want to make them all numbers, I'm going to do a copy, and then I'm going to do a paste, but I'm going to do a special paste, so I just right-clicked on this cell, and I want to paste as values. So that's what that is. And now I'm just going to delete these and move this back over. Okay. There's method in my madness, I promise. All right, so our graph is this value versus this value. So I'm going to highlight the whole thing, and I'm going to highlight this next column. You notice I have two columns labeled the same way. Um, and as I said, there's method in my madness. I want an empty column. Um, it's labeled the same. It's going to have the same values in it. But um, you will see why we want to do this shortly. So I'm going to insert a chart. It's a scatter plot. There we go. There's our chart. Um, the first thing here, this is the pH. We don't want that one. We want this one. So there's our grand plot. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, format the x-axis because I don't need all this extra space below 20 milliliter, uh, milliliters. So do, 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 do. There we go. Axis options. I don't need the minimum to be zero. The minimum can be 20, and that's going to spread my points out. That looks better. Okay. And I'm going to take the grid lines out because they annoy me. All right. So what I want to do, and I don't need a legend because there's only one set of data on here. So again, it needs a title, it needs axes labeled. But I'm what I'm going to do is I'm going to add a trend line. 
and it's linear and I'm going to display the equation and display the R squared on the chart. Okay, so there's my um, linear regression. And if you look closely at this data, you'll see it's actually giving you um, a wave here. So you can see it's going above the line and then crossing the line and coming below the line. So not all of these po these points are actually in the linear portion. And so this is where uh, this extra column comes in handy because what I'm going to do, I'm going to move points out of this series and into the other series. And it's really easy. I'm just going to drag it over here. So now you can see this last point is gray instead of orange. It's in a different series. Uh, the R squared has improved. Um, and we're just going to keep, we're going to look at the graph. What we want to do is we would like to see all of those points on the line. Um, so our regression has improved and our R squared should also improve. So we had 9959. Nine, we're now at 9978. Nine, I think this top point also should be taken out. Oh, that's looking better. So the R squared did not improve dramatically. Okay, so there's 988. Let's try one more at the bottom end. No, that didn't make any difference in our R squared value. What if we take out one at the top end? I think that might be our best bet. And so I'm just, I'm eyeballing the line where the data is falling relative to the line um, and that R squared value. So sort of a bunch of different parameters we're looking at here. Uh, we want the points to be on the line. Um, we want the gray points to be obviously not on the line. And again, this one is maybe a little bit debatable. This last one, it did improve the R squared slightly when I took that off and it went from 0.999 to 0.9995. Um, but I think that looks pretty good. And I also, I don't want to have too few points actually on my line. Um, so now this grand plot, we suggested going back 10 to 20% of the volume. So that would be back about up to six milliliters. We're going to eight, which is a little bit more, but I still think that's fairly reasonable. Oh, the other thing that I should point out is because this plot oh come on don't be like that there we go because it is including all of these blank spots the line is actually extended beyond the data okay so if i look at it's not gonna let me click on a orange point oh excuse me for a moment okay sorry about that okay so we've got our line here um it seems to be pretty good. As I mentioned, it does extend all the way through. The other way to get the line to extend, if it's not doing that, is if you cl click on the trend line options. And what you would want to do is go down here to where it says forecast, either forwards or backwards. So forwards meaning to more positive um, X values and backwards would be to more negative X values. And the periods here is sort of the units on your X axis. So you can extend it forward or backward by plugging numbers in here and that will extend the line. In this case, because we have actually uh, for the series highlighted beyond the points that we're using. So again, we can see that we've highlighted for that for both of them actually all the way down through the whole X range, it's extending the line for the whole X range. So then to get the equivalence point, the equivalence point is where this line crosses the X axis. So that would be Y equals zero. So you're going to plug that into this equation and get your um, X value, your X value. One of the things I'm noticing on this right away is both the slope and the intercept only have one sig fig. So you would either want to format that um, and you can see here the formatting has come up. You can make it scientific notation and that will give you more sig figs. Or you could do a line nest on the data. So just do a line nest on these points. Um, and then that will give you it with easily with more sig figs. Okay, so that's the grand plot. Let's go back to uh, the PowerPoint now. So the next one is the theoretical titration curves. So again, this is also for the lab. Um, you will be required to do one theoretical titration curve as part of your titration curves experiment. So one thing to keep in mind with that experiment, it's a lot of spreadsheets. So you don't want to be leaving it to the last minute. Try to get it done sooner rather than later. 
Um, it should not take you more than 45 minutes to do the entire experiment. I have been hearing about students taking three hours. Each of these titrations takes less than five minutes to run. So even with rinsing the lines, um, it should not take you that long. I will also mention that if the pH check is off, it doesn't really matter because there's absolutely no accuracy grading with these titration curves. All that matters is that the shape of the graph looks correct. If when you um, collect the data, it is not indicating the equivalence points, meaning you get NAN, which is not a number, again, that doesn't matter. All that matters is that the graph looks correct. So if the graph has one equivalence point, you're good. If, um, if it's supposed to have one equivalence point. If it has two equivalence points and, you, and you're supposed to have two equivalence points, you're fine. It does not need to be accurate. Um, and it does not need to calculate the equivalence points for you. You can do that very easily once you've done your derivative plots. The other thing that I will mention at this point with regards to titration curves in lab is that quite often with the sodium hydroxide titration, it does not finish the curve. So instead of doing something, um, it's not giving me, sorry, I gotta turn the pen on. Instead of doing something that looks like, oh, that's awful, nope. Sorry, my there. Instead of doing something that looks like that for titration of sodium hydroxide with HCl, it, it just sort of gives you the first half and then it stops. But that's okay because you can still determine what the equivalence volume is because remember, it's the volume scale that we care about, not the pH scale. So you can obviously tell that it's dropping dramatically. That's the volume for the equivalence point. So it really doesn't matter if it finishes it. You can still work with that data. Okay, so you will need to do a theoretical titration curve for this experiment and for that you're going to go to this table in the textbook um so there is a derivation in the course notes um for titration of a weak acid with strong base so that's a di der derivation of one of these titrations it's not the one you need for lab um it's just i'm not going to go through the derivation it's there in the notes if you want to look at it um, what I am going to go through is how you use these equations to generate a titration curve. So these are phi equations. So you can see we have the Greek letter phi. And then what we have is a ratio between the moles of base and the moles of acid. This is for titration of a strong acid with strong base. So the moles of acid is a constant because that's how many moles of acid you started with. The moles of base starts at zero and increases throughout the titration because you're constantly adding base. The VB constantly increases. When you've added enough base to react with all of your acid, then CBO, CBVB over CAVA will be one, meaning that phi will be one. So phi is equal to one at your equivalence point. If you're halfway to the equivalence point, phi is 0.5. If you're 10% of the way to the equivalence point, phi is 0.1. So this is just the extent to which you have finished the titration. If you have more than one titration, or sorry, more than one equivalence point, phi is one at the first equivalence point, phi is two at the second equivalence point, phi is three at the third equivalence point. So um, it has, phi calculates how many equivalents of your analyte have you added with your titrant. Um, the second part of the phi equation here will calculate what phi is equal to um, based entirely on pH and the constants. So the constants being the concentration of your titrant and your analyte. So your CA and your CB. And when we go down into the polyprotic titrations, so here we have titrating, uh, sorry, when we get into the weaks, we have weak acid with strong base, weak base with strong acid. We have um, a weak acid with weak base. If we keep going down, we can get into H2A, and H3A, and then dibasic and tribasic. All of these, you can see if you look at the equations, they all have alphas in them. So um, alpha for BH plus, alpha for A minus, and to calculate alphas, we need the pH and we need Ks, so Kas or Kbs. So the first thing you're gonna do when you're doing a theoretical titration curve is you're gonna um, look up the correct phi equation. So that means you need to read these titles and make sure you're grabbing the one for the titration that you've done. And again, we've got um, strong base with strong acid. We have weak base with strong acid. And then we have dibasic with strong acid and tribasic with strong acid. So make sure you grab the correct one. Look at the titration curve that you did. How many, 
equivalence points does it have? Because you are going to do a theoretical based on one of your experimental. So if you your experimental curve had three equivalence point, you should not be grabbing weak base with strong acid because that only has one equivalence point. Okay. So one of the things with theoretical titration curves is that they're backwards from how we do titration curve calculations manually by hand. So if we look at the example problem that we did on Tuesday and all the examples that are in the textbook and on Achieve and in the notes, they will all say for the titration of blah with blah, find the pH when so many milliliters of titrin have been added. So there'll you know, be zero milliliters added, five milliliters added, 10 milliliters added, et cetera. In the case of a the theoretical titration curve, we do that backwards. Instead of saying, this is the volume added, find the pH, we say, this is the pH, what's the volume added? Okay. When we were doing manual titration curves, we had to determine what was the uh, predominant species left after reaction um, at that point in the curve. So we would look at a, the bottom of our ice table and we would say, is it an acid? Is it a base? Is it an amphiprotic or is it a buffer? We don't do that here. Okay. We do it with the manual calculations because we have different equations to solve each of those situations. So if we decide that it's a polyprotic buffer, we use the henderson asbach equation. If we decide it's an amphiprotic, we use the amphiprotic equation. In this case, we have one equation that describes the entire curve. So going to these equations can work where our other equations fail, okay? Where those assumptions start to break down, um, these equations will work, but they do work backwards. All right, so we go to this table and we pick out a phi equation. And for many of them, we will also need alpha equations. So the bottom half of this table, which is the last table in the titration curve, the acid-based titration um, chapter in the textbook, um, but the bottom half is all of the alpha equations. Now you should already know the alpha equations um, because that's something that you need to know for the midterm, uh, but they are all written out here for up to a triprotic system. So we have monoprotic systems at the top and then the diprotics and then the triprotics. But what I want to point out here is this thing here where it says symbols. It says K1 and K2 for the acid are the acid dissociation constants for H2A and HA minus respectively. K1 and K2 for the base, and this is really important, are the acid dissociation constants for BH2, 2 plus and BH plus respectively. So with the base, we're not switching to KBs, we're still using KAs. And that should be obvious from these alpha equations because they have H plus in them. If we are calculating an alpha with H plus, all the Ks have to be KAs because KAs have H plus in them. If we wanted to calculate an alpha using hydroxide, then all the Ks would be KBs. Okay, or vice versa, if we wanted to use KBs, we'd have to derive the alphas in terms of hydroxide. Quite easy to do, definitely doable, but we haven't done that. And if you start to flip around between the two, um, you'll probably start to mix them up. Um, and there's no need to. We can calculate an alpha for all of the conjugates in the series, including the fully deprotonated version using H plus and Ka's. We don't need to switch over to Kb's. Okay, um, so we, <coughs> excuse me, we grab our phi equation, we grab our, K, our alpha equations. Here's just um, the, the phi equations for the acids. So weak acid, um, this is a diprotic and um, a dibasic. And you can see they're, they're fairly straightforward equations, um, but be careful when you're putting them in Excel, watch out for brackets, because you've got lots of fractions here. Uh, so you need to make sure your entire numerator is in a bracket. And then again, the numerator for this fraction has to be in a bracket. And similarly, the entire denominator needs to be in a, a bracket. Um, so now I'm going to switch over to um, a different spreadsheet. Where's my titration curve spreadsheet? That's this one. Okay. So, yeah. All right. So here's a titration curve spreadsheet um, for a theoretical titration curve. So what I've done, this is a, not the one that you need to do for the lab, but it's similar. Okay, so make sure when you're doing the one for the lab that you pay attention, you're asked to do a theoretical titration curve 
um, f that matches one of your experimentals and make sure you're picking the correct phi equation from the table. So here we're doing diprotic weak acid titrated with strong base. I've collected together all of the constants that I need. So I have the concentration of the acid that we started with as well as its volume, the concentration of the base, and then I have the two Ka's for this diprotic acid. And finally, I have Kw. Then the columns that I'm going to need, I'm going to need a pH column and then H plus and OH calculated from the pH, then whatever alphas I need for my phi, then my phi, and then finally for, for the volume of the titrin, which in this case is the base. So remember that the phi equation, there's two parts to it. There's one where you have CBVB over CAVA or vice versa. You can flip top and bottom depending on if you're titrating acid with base or base with acid. And from and then there's a second part to it, which is only dependent on pH. So we're going to calculate phi using the pH dependence part of the equation. And then from phi, we can calculate the volume of the titrant. Okay, so I'm going to start my pH range at 1. And then if I go down, if you look in the function box, you'll see all I've done is taken the cell above it and added 0.1. And then I just take that and I drag it down because you can see this goes on for quite a while here. Oh, I'm missing a point there, so I'm going to put that in. Uh, so I've gone down to a pH of 13. The next column over is 10 to the negative pH. Now, I have named the columns the same way that I've named these cells up here. Um, Naming columns is a little bit trickier only because if you extend the table, so if you add more rows to it, the names don't always extend. Um, so don't feel like you have to name columns. I've just done it because it does make my formulas a little bit easier to read. Um, so H plus is 10 to the negative pH, and then OH is KW over the H. Uh, and then I've calculated the two alphas. And then finally put in the phi equation and the VB equation. So this is uh, a practice in getting bigger formulas to work in Excel. Uh, we haven't done a lot of big formulas up to this point, except maybe for the quadratic on the second um, computer assignment. So again, watch your brackets. And your you Excel does follow the normal order of operations, um, but you but we do have uh, need brackets in here to make these formulas work. The other common problems are making sure that um, your Ka1 is larger than your Ka2. Uh, people sometimes get these backwards. Okay, so now that I've calculated everything out um, and I've got all my volumes, it's starting off negative. Don't worry, we can fix that later. I'm going to insert my graph because I want to see what this looks like. So I'm going to ins insert a scatter plot. And I'm going to select my data. The reason I am not just highlighting and selecting my data to make the plot is that the X value is in the last column. Um, and the default in Excel is that the first column is X and then all the subsequent columns are Y. So it would plot all of these against pH, which is not what I want. I want pH versus VB. So I'm going to manually select the data. The other way you could do it would be to copy the pH values over into column H here and then highlight the G and H columns and do your graph that way. So, all right, add my X values. Do, 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 do. So there are all my X values and then my Y values. I apologize if you can hear that my neighbors are having their leaves blown or something. It's very loud outside. Okay, there we go. So let's have a look at this graph. Awesome! Doesn't that look like a lovely, lovely titration curve? I'm just going to change this so that the points are joined together. There we go. Even better. Okay, now I've done this entirely on purpose because students will get this graph and then they're like, oh my God, I did something wrong. You've done nothing wrong, and nothing wrong. It's just that you can see we started off with some negative values and then we went into some positive values. And as we scroll down, uh, we got to this value. So we went, you know, 100, 125, 175, 339. And then we went to this ginormous number um, and so this is what's causing that graph to just look stupid, um, is that we have this massively big number on, on our scale. Um, and that is 
screwing up the graph. So there's a couple of different ways that you can deal with it. You can actually just delete these, these points from your table. And now the graph looks better. We still have to deal with the negatives. Um, but at least the, you can see the shape of the graph. The other way to do it is to just restrict your x-axis. So if I format the x-axis, see right now the minimum is negative 5 times 10 to the 11, which is a massive number. No, how about 0? Zero? 0 is a good place to start. Okay, and now it's going up to 8 times 10 to the 11. We don't need to go that big. Uh, you know, 50, 100, somewhere in that range is probably good. You can always make it smaller later if you need to. Hey, now it looks like a temptation curve. That's pretty good. I like that. We just have this line going back across because we're going from that hugely positive number to negative. Um, and so we want to, we can get rid of the negatives. Um, for the top end here of the table, what we can do is say, well, our first positive volume is at two and three quarter milliliters, and that's at a pH of 2.3. So if I start at pH 2.3, just type that in here because of the way I set it up, um, just adding 0.1 to that, it all um, works from that point on and then we can go down to the bottom and we can say well our equivalence point let's see where was our equivalence point our equivalence point looks to be around 50 milliliters so where do we want to cut the graph graph off maybe at 60 milliliters so everything from 60 down we can delete and now our graph looks awesome so I would probably now set this back to um, just to auto and it'll scale it appropriately. Put in your titles, um, whatever else it asks for, for your titration, your theoretical titration curve and the lab manual. And this is good to go. Um, so when students run into problems with the theoretical titration curve, there are two things that I look for. The first one is the shape. All right, so I'm looking for, does it go bottom to top or top to bottom appropriately for the titration curve they're trying to do? And the, is the number of equivalence points correct? So is the basic shape of the curve correct? If the basic shape of the curve is correct, your formulas are correct. If the basic shape of the curve is not correct, then the formulas are not correct, okay? So that has to do with you, like your alpha equations and your phi equation and your VB all in here. I don't think you'll screw up the H plus and the OH, but all of these rest of these, there's lots of room for error in those. Once you have the basic shape correct, the next thing you want to check is your equivalence volume. So the equivalence volumes here, this one's at about 25 milliliters and this one's at about 50 milliliters. That should match the equivalence points on your experimental curve. So go back and look at your experimental curve and you say, okay, you know, my type, my, equivalence points were at 7 and 14 and here they're at 25 and 50 no something's wrong i it doesn't match if that is the case the most likely source of the problem is these numbers here you've either got a concentration wrong or you've got an aliquot volume wrong okay so that's i think everything you need for theoretical titration curve um there are examples on course link for you to look at um there are examples in the textbook and you will need the textbook to get the phi equation Okay, so the next thing um, is dealing with complex problems. Um, so looking at situations where our assumptions start to fail. Um, so the theoretical titration curve allows us to get around that with a titration curve. Um, and I'm going to look at a couple other examples here of how do we deal with situations where our, uh, our, our approximations don't work. Um, and so I didn't have time to do successive approximations in um lecture yesterday but hey i got all the time in the world now so i can do that i just have to find the spreadsheet because of course it's a spreadsheet it's always a spreadsheet that's just where is it because that one i didn't open Okay, there's successive approximations, and there's the other one that I want. Okay. Okay. So, 
this is the first one. I'm just going to make sure that the share is working. Yes, it is. Okay, so this is successive approximations. And we're going to start um, here at the beginning. And what I'm going to do actually is delete all this and hopefully I can recreate it. Okay, so um, this is a, an example of the textbook of using successive approximations where our um, assumptions start to break down. So in this case, we're asked to find the pH of a solution that is 10 to the minus three molar hydrogen malate. Uh, hydrogen malate is the amphiprotic form of malonic acid uh, and the pKs for malonic acid are 3.46 and 5.10. And so I've plugged in the analytical concentration as 1 times 10 to the minus 3. And um, sorry, and then the assumption that we make with the amphiprotic equation is that the species concentration will be equal to the analytical concentration. So the so the species concentration is the same. It's also 1 times 10 to the minus 3. I've got my KAs that I've calculated from the PK1 and the PK2. Then I calculate the H plus concentration using the amphiprotic equation. So that's what this equation is here. And then calculate the concentrations of the three conjugates based on the H plus concentration. So H2M I'm calculating from our assumed concentration of the amphiprotic plus the Ka1 plus the H plus. And then the M2 minus is calculated from K2, again, using H plus and the assumed concentration of HM minus. Um, and so this last one, what I'm doing is actually calculating the concentration of HM minus based on a mass balance. So what did we start with minus the concentrations of these two um, other conjugates? So if you look at the list here, I actually have two concentrations for HM minus two species concentrations. So how does that make any sense? This is the one based on our assumption. So our assumption for, again, for the amphiprotic was that the species concentration would be equal to the analytical concentration. I then used that assumed species concentration plus the H plus and calculated the other two conjugates. But what we find is that they don't add up now. So the total sum, um, if we added this one and this one, and then the one times 10 to the minus three, it doesn't add up. We're way over the total. Um, these concentrations are not insignificant compared to the 10 to the minus three we started with. So the actual concentration of the HM minus would be closer to seven times 10 to the minus four. So instead of it being, um, 1 times 10 to the minus 3, it's actually closer to 7 times 10 to the minus 4. And so what we find is that the change in the HM is about 30%. It's actually gone down by 30% compared to where we started with. So then what we do is we say, okay, maybe this number is a better assumption for the HM minus than the one that we started with, that 1 times 10 to the minus 3. If we take it down to 6.9 times 10 to the minus 4, so in this cell, because I'm going to copy these formulas over, I'm going to say, okay, well, I'm going to say now that that, that is equal to the HM minus we calculated in our first approximation. Uh, KA and KB will stay the same. I'm going to copy the rest of these over. All right, so now I'm calculating the H plus using the same KAs, um, but now I'm saying that the concentration, the species concentration of HM minus is, is about 30% lower. Then calculate the two conjugates from the Ks. Something's wrong with this one. Ah, I didn't copy this over. There we go. Okay. So, and again, calculate the HM minus as what's left over. So I've calculated the other two conjugates based on the case. And then from our total of one times 10 to the minus three, 
if I subtract these two, that gives me what's left over to actually be the amphiprotic. And it's now up closer to about 80% of what we started with. So here we were at about 70% of the 1 times 10 to the minus 3. We're now up to about 80% of the 1 times 10 to the minus 3. And the change compared to um, in HM compared to the last one iteration is about 13%. And the change in the H plus is about 5%. Okay, so let's copy it over again and do a third approximation. So now this is equal to this. All right, something's weird. That can't be right. Why didn't that copy over properly? There we go. Okay, so now our change is 3.5%. So again, we're getting closer and closer to where the HM minus concentration is actually making some sense. So now it's at about 75%. So we, we started out at 70%, went up to almost 80%, and now we're down to about 75%. Okay, so that's looking a little bit better. And what we would do is we keep doing this until as we do each iteration, we don't see much change in the concentration of HM. So if I copy this over again, why is that not copying over properly? There we go. Now we only have a 1% change. So we went from 7.85 to 7.58. I'm going to do that on its own now, just because it's being a nuisance. And if we do it again, now we're down to 0.3%. And now down to 0.1%. So, and, and you can see the change in the H plus has continued to go down as we continue to iterate this. So if we continue across the way here, for our last three, we see um, to two sig figs anyway, no change in the concentration of HM minus. So it seems to be centering around 7.6 times 10 to the minus four. Um, and we see no change in our H plus concentration either. So it's settling in at 4.35 times 10 to the minus 5. So we started out at 4.52 times 10 to the minus 5. Um, and we have changed in that second sig fig um, by 0.2 when we get down to our final answer. So this is, is one way that we can use to um work or into situations where our assumptions don't work we can solve it with our assumption realizing that that's only going to be an approximate answer and then take our approximation and put it back in and do an iterative solution so do it again but instead of making our assumption like we did here where we assumed that the concentration was equal to the analytical now we're going to say the species concentration is is equal to what our last iteration gave us and we keep repeating that um, until um, we narrow down to we're getting the same answer over and over again, which is what we've got here. Okay, so that's one way to deal with problems that um, we can't solve with our equations that we have. The other example, oh, so many spreadsheets, is this one. So this is sort of an introduction to modeling chemical systems, and that's how do we deal with a mess? So this is something that's actually starting to approach a real system. So a mess we described as any mixture of weak acids and bases that are not conjugates of each other. So we can't define them as a buffer. So that's what we have here. We have uh, 20 millimolar, 20, sorry, 20 millimoles of sodium hydrogen tartrate. So sodium hydrogen tartrate, that's an amphiprotic species. It's got a hydrogen that it can lose as an acid, but can also replace this sodium with another hydrogen to become tartaric acid. We have 15 millimoles of pyridinium uh, chloride. So pyridinium chloride is the conjugate acid of pyridine. Um, so this is a weak acid. And then 10 millimoles of KOH. Well, that's a strong base and it's all diluted to one liter. And we're asked to find the pH and the concentrations of all the species in solution. So this one also involves an iterative process. This one involves goal seek. And I always make sure that I cover this in lecture because there are questions like this on the online homework on Achieve. So if you're doing that, you'll want to pay attention to this. This spreadsheet looks complicated. 
um, and long and difficult. It's not overly, if you've already worked with doing alpha equations in a spreadsheet, this is just more of them, okay? And the reason there's more of them is because we have more than one set of weak conjugates in solution. So we need to do alphas for each of the set of conjugates. So what I've done here um, is I've started off, I've got the question, and then I've uh, started off with sort of our basics, which is our H plus, our pH, and our OH. So this is going to use goal seek. So the H plus is whatever number we pick it to be. So I'm going to start at 10 to the minus 7 because that's always my favorite. Uh, so I had a pH of 7, and then the hydroxide is calculated as Kw over the hydronium. So that's fairly straightforward. That's our starting point. Then what I've done is I've collected all the information from the question as well as um, looking up Ka's. So I have my sodium hydrogen tartrate here. Um, species concentration for sodium as the counter ion will be 0.2 mol molar. The analytical concentration for the tartrate um, species will be 0 0.02 molar. Um, then I've looked up the pKa's for tartaric acid and converted them to Ka's. Similarly for the pyridine species, uh, pyridinium chloride, so I've got 0 0.015 molar chloride, that's my spectator ion or my counter ion. Um, the analytical concentration for the pyridine species is also 0 0.015 molar. Uh, the pKa for, uh, for pyridinium is 5.2, and I've calculated the Ka from that. And then finally, the KOH, this is a strong, so there's no Ks to worry about, but I do have another spectator ion for the potassium, and the analytical concentration for KOH is 0 0.01 molar. For the two sets of conjugates, all I've done is calculated alphas and then species concentrations. So this is exactly like the spreadsheet that we did last week when we were working with alpha equations. So I calculate the denominator for the tart um, tartrate species. Um, so that's H plus squared. So I'm referring back up to the H plus up here, plus K1, H plus plus K1, K2. And then for each of the three conjugates, I've got the numerator over for that species over the gen, over the uh, denominator for all the tartrates and then just to check that i've done all my formulas correctly i've actually put in a sum here um, because all of the alphas should sum to one similarly for the pyridine species there's only two conjugates so i calculated the denominator and then the two conjugates and again checked that the total sum to one um so we can see that at a ph of seven um 99.8% of the tartrate is actually in the fully deprotonated version. And similarly for the pyridine, 98.5% of it is in the deprotonated state and very little of it is protonated. If we move down to the next section, this is all the species, uh, species concentrations for our weeks. So we've got our three tartrate species. Um, and this is just going to be alpha times the analytical concentration for each of them. And again, I've double checked that I've done the formulas correctly by adding them all together and they should equal 0 0.02 molar. Similarly with the pyridines should sum up to 0 0.015 molar. Um, to make sure that everything up to this point is correct, I've actually calculated K1 and uh, the Ks. So K1 for tartaric acid would be HT um, times H plus over um, H2T. And then similarly for the K2, it would be T2 minus uh, times H plus over HT minus, and I'm just making sure that these numbers match with what I have up above so that um, I'm being consistent throughout all of my spreadsheets so far. So all we've done to this point really is we've calculated alphas and then species concentrations, and we've double checked that we've done all that correctly. We haven't really done anything else. The Where the magic happens is right here. This is the charge balance equation. Um, so we haven't done a charge balance equation on a spreadsheet yet, but all I've done is I've taken all of my ionic species. So you can see I've got um, the sodium, the chloride, the potassium. I've got the HT minus, the T2 minus, and the pyridinium hydrochloride. I've also got the H plus and the OH all included in this formula. I've taken all of the cations and added them all together and then subtracted all of the anions. Um, there is a two in there because... Um, the T2 minus has a minus two charge. So to balance out the charge, I need to take its concentration and multiply by two. Everything else is singly charged, so that's straightforward. Okay, so the charge balance should, if we took all the cations and subtracted all the anions, the result should be zero. It should be zero. This is not zero. This is point, negative 0 0.02 molar. So this is where we use the goal seek. So 
data, what if, goal seek, um, our set cell is where our our um, charge balance is. Our two value is zero. We want it to be equal to zero. And by changing cell, we're going to change the H plus. OK, so we got a value of 0. 0.00088. Now, we actually have concentrations on here that are smaller than this number. So this is not close enough to zero as it stands. Uh, it needs to be a lot closer to zero uh, because we would like the the um, sort of residual charge. There isn't actually a residual charge, um, but what it's giving us is the residual charge should be much smaller than any of the concentrations that we have in our species. So this is not low enough, which makes me wonder what is my maximum change sent to? Oh yeah, way too big. So I'm going to say e to the minus Let's do 15. So that's going to be 0 to 14 decimal places. OK, well, that took a bit long, a little bit longer. Oh, that looks better. Lots of zeros there. We could make the maximum change 10 to the minus 20. Um, it does not matter if this is negative at all because it's um whether it's negative or positive doesn't matter it's just matters that it's very close to zero um if you're not sure if you have enough zeros then probably what i would do would be to make note of what your h plus value is and then make the maximum change a little bit smaller and see if your h plus changes significantly when you redo the what if with more zeros but that's it do the what if and now all the species concentrations are here you've got your hydronium you've got your hydroxide you've got all your conjugates um, they're all calculated for you okay so that is a mess all right so next week we will do some review for the midterm because the midterm is a week tomorrow um, and we will be starting on solubility chemistry that's it for today i'll get this posted all right stop recording